what happens if you do a brow lift on somebody who doesn't need it? The thing that I worry about mainly with brows is that people don't understand necessarily like what the brow consists of and how it ages. So uh, we have to remember when we're looking at the brow that the brow is not just the hair that we see, but it's also the skin underneath this area that has that kind of fatty skin and the fat, the muscle, everything else that kind of is a part of the brow. This is really important because at the most basic level of beauty, people are doing kind of pencil markers, drawing, uh, eyeliner, things like that, and then there's actual tattooing and micropigmentation. So first off, I tell all my patients, please be cautious when you get micropigmentation or when you get tattoos on the brow, never to draw above or below your natural brow line where your actual hairs are, because what'll happen is you'd actually be drawing up onto your forehead. So there are subunits here. You have your brow, you have your eyelid, you have your temporal area or temporal fossa, and you have your forehead. You don't want to draw brow hairs onto forehead skin. It has to stay on brow skin. Now, let's say you're just doing it temporarily. You'd probably be okay uh, just drawing it. Nothing ever happens. The place where people get harmed is kind of where the Hadids were, where you could see how everybody said, okay, how did the Hadids have eyebrows that looked like they're kind of stretched out and arched like that? Or it didn't look like it was necessarily from brow lifting originally, although now it probably is. Back then it looked like they just had a ponytail in place plucked out the lateral eyebrows and then drew it on. Now, I can't know for sure, they're not my patients, I've never treated them, that's what it looked like. So doing something like that has no harm because you drew it instead of tattooing it, but you do have the downside of losing those hairs there if you're ever, ever to pluck it and try to arch it. Okay, so that's makeup and tattooing. And if I gotta teach you about makeup and I'm a guy, it's kinda sad, but <laughs> that's unfortunately how the world goes. So uh, just like with everything else, it has to remain natural, whether it's tattooing, makeup, dentistry, anything has to remain natural. Then we look at why do we do a brow lift and how can we do one? Brow lift typically we want to do because the brow is drooping or dropping on the side where it's hooding over the eye and it's crowding the upper eyelid. That's the main reason to do a brow lift. And it's very different doing one or needing one on somebody young versus somebody older. And the types of lifting that we have in general are Botox or neurotoxins. We have heat-based therapies, which don't work, so uh, we'll talk about that briefly. You have thread lifts, which also don't work. We'll talk about that. And then you have surgeries, so we'll go through the different types. The big kind of popular move in the past uh, couple of years has to get your eyebrows snatched and to pull them out really tight and arch them and stretch them and maybe get a fox eye, a cat eye, or whatever the hell those crazy things are. So things that look crazy now will definitely age poorly, so you have to remember that. And there's a big difference on doing these kind of things on somebody young versus somebody old. We'll start with just the basic Botox stuff which anybody can do that's safe to do what you do with the Botox is typically the way you look at the face is that it's kind of like a trampoline with little springs everywhere and they all have their resting tone Botox would knock out one of those springs and the other springs would pull more towards them so frontalis muscle is some springs you've got your orbicularis uh, oculi muscle you have orbicularis that comes up here which is different that depresses the brow and if you Botox these and relax the muscle it'll arch slightly upwards or not come down as much when you smile. And this is something I've had done before I placed Botox here. The thing to know about Botox or Dysport or Xeomin, Juvo, whatever you want to use, I use Dysport, is that when you place it, you want to place it down into the infrabrow contractors, depressors, these guys, these muscles. People who have narrower eyes and broader brows end up getting a bigger lift because there's more area that they can inject. People like me, you can't get much because my canthus, the end of my eye, is near the end of my brow and I can only inject between those two areas. I cannot go medial to this to lift the brow. If I inject here with Botox, it can travel to my levator muscle, which is the muscle that controls your eyelid opening along with cranial nerve three. If you do that, you get eyelid ptosis, meaning you get kind of a sleepy eye on one side, you get wonky. And in most cases, that'll be temporary, lasts about three months and it'll go away. In rare cases, I've heard it's had a permanent effect, not the permanent full effect, but a mild effect, or it brought out someone's underlying ptosis and kept it there. So it's important to just be cautious. It happens. Sometimes you can cause ptosis by injecting somebody here or here. You know, don't blame the doctor too much. It, it can happen. But that's Botox, and I like to use it to arch the brow slightly to make it a little brighter, 
or to prevent it from pulling down when you smile. There are cases where I have pretty substantial brow ptosis or brow drooping and it's like this and I have a couple cases on the website where I inject them and they spring up pretty dramatically. That's pretty uncommon so I wouldn't expect that from Botox or neurotoxins but it can happen. The other thing I mentioned was heat-based therapies. The classic one that was mentioned in the past was either CO2 laser that helped or Althera. I'll tell you pretty definitively, Althera will have no benefit long-term, no positive benefit. It can probably stiffen up the area just from contracture temporarily for a couple months and then it goes away. And if anything, you lose volume. And when you lose volume, your brow drops. So as the brow ages, you're getting increased laxity. So the scalp, which is kind of tight and taut, can tend to become more lax over time. You can lose muscle tone, you can get thinning of the skin, and you can get overall fat deflation. So all these things can contribute to brow drooping over time, as well as hypercontracture, stronger contracture of these muscles pulling it down. So if you're gonna do Althera on these areas, you're gonna be exaggerating one of, or two of those things and actually thin out the muscle, which can make it worse for aging. So I recommend against that. CO2, in rare situations on super thin skin, just like a chemical peel, can actually give a bit of a lift in really, really thin skin, like light white Irish type skin. You know, that does happen every once in a while where you get a lift from that, but that's not really the reason to do those is to get a lift, it's to make the skin look better. So if anybody says they're gonna give you a lift with Althera, I wouldn't believe it. I do profound and profound can get a little bit of an improvement, but it's really not predictable. So I don't tell people it's gonna do that, just sometimes we see the results and we get excited. Next step is the threads. So back to Snatched. There is a movement of people wanting to look fox-eyed or animal-eyed or cat-eyed. Uh, or snatched. There is no surgical procedure that produces this long term in a safe way unless you have substantial drooping or a down canting of the eye and then you take it up and you get a nice difference. Everything else that you see that pulls the eye like that is either fake or it's temporary, meaning somebody did the procedure and they took the photo in the first couple of months. That's not a result, that is a transient change that you see with swelling and pulling and whatever surgical procedure was done. Most of the procedures I've seen that go directly after that end up causing shortening of the eyelid, so it actually goes in the opposite direction. Webbing of the eyelid or scarring, pretty bad scarring because it pulled right back down. The thing that confuses me is why people do threads in the brows. So the thread lift, it is a lift where a suture type of material called polydioxanone or PDO is passed through under the skin, tries to grab this and contracts the area. This physically cannot produce a real lift, meaning it's not fully impossible, but 99.9% .9 impossible, where it can't really actually get a long lasting lift because it hasn't reset anything, it hasn't released anything, all the attachments are still there. And for it to work, you would have to cause a substantial amount of scarring internally, which would have a lot of negative effect. And most of these cases don't have any really big negative effect, so you'd assume that the scarring isn't substantially there and the lift fails. So when you do the thread lifts in the brow, you end up looking freaky and weird like this for about two weeks. Pulls up excessively, bunches this area and you get horns. Two weeks later, you look good for two weeks because you have some stiffness and swelling and the thread's kind of halfway holding. For five weeks, half the tension of that's gone and now it's gone back to normal. And let's say it hasn't gone back to normal. During that time, you also have limited brow motion, which is not great. It limits expression. The only way to get a thread to work would be to do a partially surgical procedure where you'd have to go actually release everything and then use the thread to pull up, which is called a suture. So that would potentially work, but otherwise I would say please don't do threads. I don't see big benefits from it. So now getting to brow lifting, let's talk about kind of young and then old because I like to talk about problems first. That's what you always have to worry about when you're doing a cosmetic procedure is avoiding problems because you're doing something elective. You're choosing to do this. It's not a health necessity and anything you do can potentially make you age worse. So you have to have a very justifiable reason for doing it. Most patients who come in who are young and they do a brow lift, they just wanna get more of an arch. Now, maybe one or two out of 10 would actually need a brow lift that I see who are in their 20s and early 30s. And that's because naturally they just have a totic or heavy eyebrow. And those patients would get a nice change because they have the laxity to support it. The issue number one is durability. So let's say you do a brow lift on somebody who doesn't need it, or they just want a little arch. This part over here is attached to it. This is your cheek. Young people have very dense cheeks. When you lift up the brow, the cheek is still attached and it will slowly take it back down. So let's say you do a brow lift on somebody who doesn't need it. Even if they like it, it's about a two-year duration, durability, 
for which it can last. Uh, it can't really last much longer than that unless you get really lucky, but you don't want to ever operate based on your chance of luck. So for young people, I advise most of them not to do it because their cheek's just going to pull it down anyways. There is an exception where you would do a mid-face lift along with it, where you go release everything and you take everything up. Now your duration of effect is going to be a bit longer because the cheek will take a little bit more time to come down with the brow and you have to do Botox here to maintain it. What happens if you do a brow lift on somebody who doesn't need it? So the issue I see is that people don't understand beauty. Beauty is multifactorial and our brains are very simplistic. So for example, when we're looking at the lip, lots of doctors think, hey, let's go just add volume. Volume makes it more beautiful. That's overly simplistic or overly stupid. It's not a very bright type of understanding of what the lip is or the face is. There are so many things that contribute and I can list probably 20 but what we're talking about is coloration, color gradients, meaning you can have darker coloration on the outside than the inside, highlights on the lip, accent to the lip, definition on the border, lack of vessel and pigment, volume, volume show, slope. There's a million things that go into it that we will not fully understand. And anytime we operate on somebody, we have to be aware that there are things that we're going to affect negatively and things out of those that we will affect positively. For the brow, for example, there is a big benefit to having a full brow and we've seen that with age. As people get older, they hollow out, it starts to droop and the more hollow you look, the more skeletonized it looks, the older it looks. Having a fuller brow gives a softer appearance to somebody. And this is another aspect of beauty, not that it's multifactorial, but it can project onto people. So just like you have emotional projection. Emotional projection means somebody has anxiety, somebody else around them will feel their anxiety, that's projection. Or you talk to somebody and they start getting angry, you'll start to feel their anger. If they're happy, you'll start to feel their happiness. Then there's actual physical projection where someone's appearance can affect you. An easy example of this is eyelid ptosis or eyelid drooping where one of the eyelids is sleepy or two of the eyelids are sleepy, they're like this. When people, other people around them talk to those patients, they end up feeling themselves a little bit sleepy, a little bit tired, and they talk slower to that person. So there is a large component of, I'd say, emotional or expressive projection that you need to worry about when you're doing surgery as well. When it gets to the brow, people overlift sometimes and you get one benefit which is the arch improve so the patient's so excited because they got that beautiful arch that they wanted what they're not noticing is the other two things number one they're going to look older sometimes because this area is too tall now your balance from your forehead to your brow to your upper eyelid is off because this area is too tall and this happens very often even with very good doctors if you look at them doing brow lifts on young people this area just looks tall and strange now, there's some patients are so excited about the arch, they don't care. The other thing that I see very common, other than the height, is the actual appearance doesn't look as soft anymore, meaning they get more of a surprised, stark, or hostile appearance. So when you lift somebody's brow who doesn't need it, you've opened up their eyes, and that projects onto other people a feeling of hostility or surprise or just a little bit more of a rough behavior rather than soft, subtle, and pleasant. So these are all things that you have to consider when you're doing brow lifts, especially on younger patients. And I have to convince a lot of patients not to do it for those reasons. I say, listen, you're going to get one positive and you're going to get plenty of negatives. So please be careful deciding to do a brow lift. And also, let's say you have a good effect on young patient. Again, it's not going to last more than two years. It ends up falling down unless they really need it. So getting to older patients. Older patients tend to have more laxity. They've had more time for this to come down and crowd onto the cheek and they have more temporal kind of excess. So when you get an older patient, you're actually able to reset them more easily by releasing everything and get a more, it's a more durable result. So the types of brow lifts that we have, we have my favorite is an endoscopic or an endoscopic style brow lift. The idea of this is you make an incision back in the hairline, you release all the attachments down across the orbital rim, the procerus, down into the cheek, and you can reset the scalp. The vector should follow the vector of drooping, which is typically along the temporal crest or where the chondroit tendon inserts over here on the muscle. Because of muscle motion and the natural attachments in the face, patients tend to age this way. And that means that this area ages vertically, this area ages this direction, and more vertical as you go here. So when you're lifting somebody, this goes more vertical, that goes more back that way, and then this goes more that way. So it's a reset of the scalp. These are called endoscopic style or endoscopic brow lifts. 
Those typically do not make the forehead much bigger. It kind of resets it to where it used to be. So if somebody has a tall forehead, you can still do this as long as you don't overlift them or lift them in the wrong vector. Classically, that's the problem. Doctors were lifting people in this direction, so a long forehead would end up looking super tall. If you lift them in this direction, you end up just resetting them to where they used to be. And I ask my patients, did you ever have a problem with your forehead being too tall? If they have a kind of tall forehead, they say no. I say, okay, I'm going to reset you to that. So you make your incision, you go down and release everything all the way around and reset the entire scalp. The other types of brow lifts you have, you have coronal, hemicoronal, pretracheal, tracheal, which means you could go along the hairline and cut out skin and actually reduce the height of the skin. You do forehead lowering coming the other way and combine it, or you can go back here, remove some skin and reset everything from there. I do not like doing those. I can do such a versatile, strong brow lift with this technique and get such a big movement that I do not need to do that for any reason other than paralysis. Then we have direct and mid forehead lifts. Direct brow lifts or super brow, you can make an incision over here and you excise and lift that up. That's great for bald guys and it's great on revisions, meaning somebody who's had a bad brow lift where they lifted too much centrally, even if you go do an endoscopic, the tail might still be disproportionately low. You can go do a direct excision over there, like you would do a corner lift on a lip, same idea, and actually get that part up as well. And I do that quite often on revisions. Otherwise, I don't like to cut here too much, just because on some patients, you're gonna lose a couple of hairs. I definitely don't like to come all the way across. It's not great to cut here unless you really, really have to. The hair pattern here is very fine. There's little baby hairs. If you come across them, it'll look coarse. Mid forehead lifts, again, in certain situations, I perform them. That's when you put it into a crease over there. Interestingly, you can get an improvement in brow position just by doing a facelift sometimes. And this is good to know because it refers back to the same issue that I was discussing with younger patients. Younger patients have densely attached cheeks. If you lift this, it lifts against a densely attached cheek, it'll pull back down. Often what I see with facelifting is once you release the face and lift it up vertically, you get offloading of the brow, which means there's less tension in this area. These muscles naturally can start to contract a little bit stronger. So even if you do a cheek lift that does not extend to the brow, the brow can automatically lift up itself because of offloading. The weight's offloaded and it can go back up slightly. These are all things that you have to consider when you're doing brow lifts. I advise most patients who are young, don't do it, stick to Botox. Don't listen to doctors who are gonna try to put in threads or try to fill over here dramatically to pop out your head and make the brow lift from volumization. It's not good to make your forehead or your skull bulky. So fillers generally do not contribute much to brow lifting, so stay away from that. Botox is fine. Heat-based therapies are by no way predictable and never have been for brow lifting. They will never be because there's no good mechanism for them to actually work. And if you do need it, make sure you go to somebody who does a lot of these things, uh, does not use any crazy wording to describe their types of procedures. You want something natural. Natural will lift you in the vector that you aged, which is what you want. It'll last longer and it'll age better. The last thing you want to do when you're 20 years old, 25 years old, is do a procedure that will condemn you to uh, a lifelong of facial doom when you're 30 to 45 years old that you can never fix. So. Keep that in mind. That's what's happening right now with a lot of 20 year olds is that they're doing stuff that are screwing them in the future because any facial plastic surgery procedure can make you age worse. You wanna do something that's gonna make you age better. If you have any questions, feel free to ask your local providers.